age and gender who bear the double brunt of age and gender. The current climate interventions fail to adequately account for women and girls' realities in this crisis, such as increasing gender-based violence, inaccessibility to healthcare, finance, and technology, and disruption of their education. They are often also excluded from participating in decision-making within households and communities, or in disaster risk reduction activities that could expose them to life-saving information, resources, and skills. Today's webinar is being organized in the lead up to the 66th session of the Commission on the Status of Women. This session, that is CSW 66, will take place from 14 to 25th of March, 2022. The priority theme of the upcoming CSW reads as follows. Achieving gender equality and the empowerment of all women and girls in the context of climate change, environmental and disaster risk reduction policies and programs. Before starting, I would also like to mention that this event is being organized by us, the young people, in collaboration with the IBVM UN NGO, the Mary Ward Center in Toronto and in Spain and the UK. Uh, we would like to take this opportunity to introduce ourselves. Zinzi, would you like to go first? Um, sure. Hello, everyone. My name is Zinzi. Um, uh, I am a second year university student at the University of Toronto, double majoring in criminology and political science. Um, and I'm also um, an intern for the Mary Ward Center. So it's very nice to be here today. Hello everyone, my name is Ailish. I am currently a first year student at the University of Oxford studying history and I'm a past pupil of Loretto in Manchester. So it's lovely to be here. And uh, I'm uh, Carlotta. I am uh, the Institute of the Blessed Virgin Mary's um, a youth representative in Spain and also a past pupil of one of the schools in Madrid. I'm also a last year student of a double degree in business administration and international studies at Carlos III University in Madrid. And additionally, I'm also working as an intern in a consultancy firm and I'm very happy to be with you here today. Thank you. And as for me, I'm Rhea Bhargav, a past pupil of St. Agnes's Laudato Day School in India and the youth representative intern at the IBBM UN NGO office in New York. Aside from policy and government, which I'm interested in, I am also an aspiring nanotechnology and AI major in college. Thank you, Sensei. If we could move over to the next slide. So the first thing that we would be talking about in today's webinar will be the youth engagement opportunities at the UN, UN and in Spain. Over the last year, the imagination, ideals and energy of young people have been vital in shaping our presence at the UN and our engagement with communities around the world. The IBVM UN NGO aims to provide as many opportunities as possible to young girls in our network and we do so as a part of the WGG, that is the Working Group on Girls, a coalition of NGOs working to improve and empower young girls around the world. In the following few minutes, all of us would be discussing a few opportunities that were offered to girls, including us, the young interns at UN and around the world, to engage with UN processes and to contribute to the global discourse. Um, thank you, Sensei. Next slide. So the first thing that we would be talking about is the International Day of the Girl 2021. For this year's International Day of the Girl Summit, students from our schools around the world were invited to submit videos, poems, and artworks to express their thoughts on the theme of the Girl Speak Out this year, that is closing the digital gender divide to accelerate change. On October 11, one of our girl advocates led the girl speak out, moderating the discussion between a panel of young activists and adult representatives from the Permanent Mission of Canada, Peru, and Turkey to the United Nations, and UNICEF, UNFPA, and UN Women.
Okay, so um, in October, um, on October 25th of 2021, we also organized a webinar targeted at bringing young people together to make their voices heard follow, following an intergenerational format with two guest speakers, Mike Kane and Beth Blisman. Our first speaker, Mike Kane, has been a member of a parliament in the UK since 2014 and he focused his speech on his role as a Catholic in public life and shared with us his experience towards contributing to tackle climate change in a time prior to the COP26. And our second speaker, Beth Blisman, was an NGO representative of the Loreto community to the UN. She talked about the role of women in combating climate, climate change in an era in which feminist action is on the rise. We have another initiative following. Yeah. Uh, the next thing that we would like to talk about is the December Global Climate Conversation Circle. In December, the Working Group on Girls organized a global conversation circle to address girls' views on climate change. Participants were girls aged between 14 to 18, and these girls had the opportunity to share their personal experiences and stories on how climate change has affected them and the young girls in their community. Here we worked with the other members of the WGG to help organize this global conversation circle and several other smaller circles hosted on different scales and in different languages. The outcomes and recommendations from these conversation circles were submitted to the UN Women. Along with three girl advocates from South Asia, Carlota and I helped facilitate these groups at the bigger conversation circle. And some of the most common subtopics that were brought up by girls uh, included climate displace displacement and migration, infringement of sexual and reproductive health rights, and the discontinuation of girls' education. On February the 23rd, uh, as a Spanish youth's rep representative for the IBBM, I organized also a national conversation circle with students from six of the Loreto schools located in three different cities of Spain, Madrid, Seville, and Bilbao. Participants ranging between 15 to 18 were split into small groups of six to have a conversation on the following topic, gender equality and climate change. Each one, had a, a specific role following the working group on girls conversation circles format, that is being a facilitator, rapporteur, or a delegate. And it is also worth mentioning that both girls and boys were enrolled in these events. Moreover, they also shared their, concer their concerns towards living in a world of plastic pollution in the respective cities and the need for quality climate education in Spanish schools. Um, now you would be talking about CSW 66, that is the upcoming session of the Convention on the Status of Women. So the three events that we want to talk about here is the statement writing session, the Girls Caucus, and Custodians of Our Common Home, a parallel event that is being organized by the IBBM UN NGO. So about statement writing, to kickstart the engagement of girls at this year's CSW, a small group of girl delegates selected from the WGG member organizations met virtually from 5th of February through 20th February to develop and draft the girl statement to CSW 66. The aim of this statement was to draw attention to the key issues faced by girls in everyday life and to make recommendations to member states on how to advance gender equality, all from the perspective of girls. This statement was drafted by girls for girls. The draft document was then presented to a bigger group of girls to make it more compre comprehensive and, and all encompassing of insights that the new girls had to offer. A copy of this draft will also be presented to you later today as a part of the panel discussion. The second event that we would like to discuss is the Girls Caucus. The Girls Caucus is hosted in collaboration with UN Women and is a public forum for girls to discuss the progress at the Commission on the Status of Women in regards to the interests and needs of girls. This is also a platform for girls to come together and collaborate with global peers. 
For example, one of the WGG girl advocates had the chance to present during the girl's statement during the girl's caucus, and she's talked about and presented the girl's statement that was previously drafted in the statement writing sessions. Lastly, Custodians of a Common Home is a parallel event being organized by the IBBM UN NGO in collaboration with Tarumitra. in collaboration with Tarumitra and Vivath International. We would be leaving a link to registration for this particular parallel event so that you can access this event as it happens in, during the coming CSW sessions. Thank you, Sensei. Okay, so now let's follow with the survey analysis. Like in our previous youth-led webinar uh, last October, we conducted a survey to see how young people, um, to see how young people's opinions and concerns on climate change. This time respondents out outnumbered those from October because we had a total of 352 people answering this survey. As for the results, we can start by looking at some of the questions and the different answers we got. Please, Cindy, could you pass on the next slide? The next one, please. Thanks. Okay, so in here in the first question, you will see that it is the following one. To what extent are you affected by climate change? With 350 answers, we can see how the majority of respondents, more specifically 212, um, are mildly affected. However, we can still see how others position themselves in the two extremes, which are badly affected or not affected or, or at all, maybe due to the geographic area where they live. If we go with the next questions, we will see how question number two is, how is climate change affecting the area where you live? Here, the two most popular responses were an increase in heavy precipitations, followed by intense heat waves, which means increasing temperatures. And additionally, many people emphasized the excess cold and heavy decrease in temperatures. If we have a look at question number four, what scares you the most when looking at the impact of climate change in the long term, this goes in line with question number two. And here, people were very scared about the future coming generations, their own future perspectives, and also the uncertain climate conditions which our planet Earth will face. If we follow with question number three and question number six, uh, we can see that question number, six, uh, question number three was, what are you currently doing to tackle climate change and its effects? In this question, the top answers were recycling uh, clothes, food and products used, reducing food waste, using public transport or even walking. And other interesting answers were reducing plastic consumption with small acts such as using jute bags instead of plastic ones, promoting green spaces with tree planting, and also switching to a so-called sustainable way of life by using electric vehicles or even re reducing meat consumption. If we look at question number six, here we can see the solutions that young people who were responding to the survey proposed. Some of the most repeated ones mentioned the need for action of governments world leaders and also people. And turning to question number five, we asked um, young people how worried they were about their future. Here, we got a total of 348 respondents. And in this example, 125 people were very extremely worried, while 89 and 82 were very worried and worried respectively. Um, so moving on to question seven and ten. Um, so question seven was what was the main challenge? To, what are the main challenges to your voice and agency with regards to the discussions about climate and disaster risk reduction? So what's really clear from these responses is that this question in this question is that young people don't actually feel their voices and opinions are being heard. As the most common answer with 220 respondents was a lack of listening from global leaders in politics, business and state areas. And at 47 percent, this is a really stark statistic. Um, on question 10, we asked if you had the chance to meet the leaders um, of your country or government or business, what would you ask them to address about climate change? 
This was an open question and one of the most common themes amongst the respondents was the desire for more education around the damage of climate change in order to prepare young people for their future roles in addressing the consequences of current governments. Waste and pollution being mentioned in six and five percent of the answers is also a key concern that young people really want governments to address imminently. Question eight asked which youth groups are missing from the discourse about climate change. And in response to this question, most respondents highlighted indigenous communities followed by young women and girls, which together present a total of 220 respondents. And finally, question nine asked, what do you think, or who do you think is leading the narrative related to climate change? And overwhelmingly, this option gave the answers of states, international organizations, NGOs, and young leaders, but crucially, young leaders were the most common responses, 45%. This indicates the real strength of influence that young people can actually have in the discussion about climate change. Okay, so now after these very interesting results from the survey we conducted, we will follow with uh, our guest speakers. They will be intervening by the following order. Uh, first, we would like to start uh, with uh, Janet Carlos Sama, but I think she's, she's not been here with us today, right? Second, we would follow with uh, Marta Martinez, who is um, head of analysis and special projects, climate change and alliances division in a Spanish company, which is called Iberdrola. And then we'll follow with Jevi Kashir, a national gender youth advocate to UN women in India following with uh, two videos from uh, uh, two speakers. Uh, one is Olive uh, Lanyon, a student from L the Loreto Ballarat School in Australia. And the other speaker that we have is Anitalia Pijati Cuyuedo, who's an indigenous rights activist in the Amazons in Colombia. And finally, we will end with a very interesting video from the working group on girls. So let us start with Marta, who's here with us today. Okay, so hello everybody. Uh, well, first of all, thank you so much to the Institute of the Blessed Virgin Mary for the organization of this dialogue and also for the invitation to, to participate. As an alumni of um, Vorbe schools in, in Madrid a long time ago now, it's for me really an honor to be part of this community. And I, uh, I've already learned a lot with, with all the things that have already been said. And I, I really look forward to, to this conversation. So uh, as it's been said, climate change is, is one of the key challenges facing humanity. It's not only a global environmental problem because it has also a very important ethical dimension as its cross-cutting effects have implications beyond the environment. First, because climate change will not have the same impact uh, across regions of the world. And as we are seeing, vulnerable populations are affected more and they are also the ones with less means to adapt. And second, because the green gas, greenhouse gases that we're emitting today are shaping the climate for future generations. So for the past 15 years, as um, Carlota mentioned, I've been working in the energy sector and I'd like to focus on the view from, from my sector, from, from the energy um, area and our views towards climate change, um, its emergency and its urgency, and also looking at it, the views from sustainable development perspective. Um, so tackling climate change requires a full transformation of the energy system. Uh, I've seen in the survey, I know some of the answers there on what actions are you taking? Well, some of those had to do with energy. Uh, I saw there public transportation and so on. Uh, and also looking at what would you ask for your leaders? No? And, and there were some questions there, and I'm uh, sorry, some, some concepts that I mentioned. So our energy system today, which is based on fossil fuels, is the main cause of global warming. And it is actually responsible for almost three fourths of our greenhouse gas emissions. At the same time, energy is a key driver of development and has a key role to play in reaching the sustainable development targets of the UN 2030 agenda. So um, 
And I'd like to point here that how energy is central to, to, to development in the sense that energy and access to energy has a strong correlation with education, with health, with livelihoods, and especially, which affect, especially affects women also. There's about 800 million people that have no access to electricity today, and about 2.2 billion without access to modern cooking fuels. So clean energy access fosters livelihoods. It saves time that sometimes have to be dedicated to some activities, for example, time dedicated to collect, collecting full wood or water. And it, this allows time to dedicate to other activities like studying. It extends workable hours, it improves education, it improves our quality and all the health implications that that has, and it raises our human development indicators. Um, so this is why energy is so central, but it is also central because there are solutions in the energy sector that can be applied and that can be um, that are that are really important to tackle this crisis. So so it's the cause of the problem because it's based on fossil. The energy model today is based on fossil fuels, but it is also um, it, it's also part of the solution by decarbonizing the system with a combination of energy efficiency and renewable energies. So having been working in this sector for, for this number of years now and in a power company that is very much engaged in decarbonizing its energy mix, what I'm seeing is really a technological revolution uh, for these number of years. And, and it's really taking all these solutions very far up in the, in the, in the scale. And so scenarios, that were really unthinkable just a number of years ago are really possible today because we have um, the technologies to do it. So clean energies have achieved sustained and really substantial reduction costs. For instance, energy like wind energy has reduced its generation costs by 80%, 85%, solar photovoltaic by, by 50 and 60. And now we're seeing how all these frontiers um, are being pushed now, and in fact, in many areas of the world, um, renewable energies are now cheaper to install than fossil fuel plants for electricity generation. Um, what this means is that we can make electricity a backbone of the transformation of the energy sector, uh, also in the fight against climate change, and it provides competitive energy and clean energy, which can also help decarbonize our end, end uses. No? We're seeing progress in the transport sector with, with um, sustainable modes of transport, also in heating and cooling. Um, and there's also now very promising technologies and new vectors for hard to abate sectors, for instance, green hydrogen. I think that over the last year, uh, uh, there's lots of discussion on green hydrogen. Uh, basically, what this means is the capacity to produce hydrogen using renewable energies as opposed to burning or extracting it from, from, from methane. Um, and it can be a vector for some and industries like fertilizers or maybe for transport, for transport some modes of transport. So um, the decarbonization of the energy model is, is what I would like to transmit is that it's technically possible. It's also economically possible. Um, it's not easy. It's a huge challenge, and it's a huge challenge that we have ahead to keep the Paris Agreement targets in sight. Um, but the process is already triggering uh, the generation of new opportunities in a, in a range of fields. So, so we have new opportunities in green jobs because the scale of the number of green jobs has to grow in innovation in digitization, in new industries and services that are going to develop uh, in the green economy, climate services, applied science of this climate, um, of this, of this climate projections, um, policy making will have to grow also in, in a number of fields. So, so there's a there's a wide range of opportunities there for you, the youth and 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 and, and future generations and, and well actually not future present the, the opportunities are there right now, and also we're detecting the need to foster skills and careers of the future and engage youth and particularly women in this sector in the energy sector, um, because it's a sector that has a, an enormous potential of transformation. Um, not only on the energy system, but also way beyond in other um, economic areas and other socioeconomic areas and other day-to-day -day activities that we do. So um, 
I'll leave it here for now, uh, but this is basically my message to you today is to really realize and, and like to share with you the opportunity that we see in the energy sector um, to really transform the things that we did today. Thank you. Thank you, Marta. Uh, we've had a, 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 well, your speech was very interesting from the energy sector perspective. And now we're having uh, Jevika Shiv. Jevika, the floor is yours. Thank you. Would you be able to project for me? Sure. Um, just the presentation. Just, uh, just, yeah, just two seconds. seconds. No rush. Hi, everyone. So I just wanted to, I mean, I'll tell you when you can start projecting. I just wanted to introduce myself a little bit to say, and first say thank you for inviting me here. I'm very excited to meet, meet so many young people across the globe and have a conversation with all of you while you have developed your own recommendations and also looked at what youth can do um, around climate change, around CSW, around youth engagement. And I think you're a powerful group of young people working on um, you know, bringing youth to the global agenda. And I must say that I was really, really excited to see that you actually believe that youth are, youth are the ones driving this change, right? So I just want to bring uh, a little bit of a context. Um, I'm a national gender youth advocate, also part of a team of about 300 uh, young people across the globe who've been nominated uh, to UN Women uh, to work with UN Women as civil society youth uh, to look at how we can bring in the youth agenda. And for this year's CSW, we have looked at, um, you know, bringing in the voices of young people who've been leading the climate change, climate action, climate crisis uh, response, and also looking at the participation of young people, especially uh, young girls and adolescent girls in the discourse. So I just wanted to bring some of that in. I'm also going to take a moment to share in the chat, um, you know, global youth recommendations that all of us have put together. Uh, these have come from about 30 youth consultations of young people across the globe with about 2,000 um, young people who work on gender, youth, and climate change. But also many of you who may have inputted in the youth forum and other spaces of the CSW, and you might have engaged. I see some familiar names um, who went for it. But if, they, if you didn't, the recording is available of the youth forum, where youth, uh, especially girls, have put up their agenda of what they want to take to CSW, how they want to negotiate with member states. So I just want to sort of say, like, what are we pushing for? as youth and why you know i think especially coming from the global south being a youth leader myself and having been a girl leader in the past i think um you know we are saying that youth need to be centered in the middle of the climate change discourse we're also saying um you know to center youth there are a couple of things that have to be done now and i think the young feminist manifesto last year um that some of us co-authored sort of spoke about the reality of co-leading co-creating and participation of youth in these processes if you could go to the next slide And these recommendations have been developed over consultations, over trying to bring in youth leaders who've been working at generation equality, youth leaders who've been working on the climate change negotiations across the world, um, you know, with COP26, with uh, UNFCCC uh, processes, with biodiversity processes. Some of us have, you know, whether you're part of government, whether you're part of civil society, whether you're part of different groups of youth. So we've tried to look at what has come out from across the globe. And if you look at it, um, you know, these are some of the key priority themes that I'm going to actually present in front of you. But I want to say all of this is to push youth engagement, to have a youth body that speaks about it at the local level, at the country level, at the national level, at, um, you know, the regional level, and also at the global level with the UN and with member states listening to youth. But what does that mean? That means in this agreed conclusions, we need to start talking about the youth voice, right? In CSW, start talking about young women and girls and youth and all their diversity coming in to inform the agenda. It's something that our common agenda, which was also talked about um, in the larger General Assembly of the UN, speaks about establishing a youth advisory body. Uh, if you could just go to the next slide, please. Um, you know, and it's something that's come up in our recommendations, co-leading, co-creating, and co-ownership of youth, especially indigenous youth, vulnerable youth, youth which is minorities in their own countries, marginalized youth, youth from the most affected areas, right? Because we do see the small island, for example, are most affected in the Pacific and could face literally climate erasure um, because of climate change, right? So 
also looking at those who may live at the you know at the heart of conflict displacement land based uh, issues volcanic eruptions drought areas and especially within that what are girls saying so girls are saying center us allow us to speak and say our own versions uh, young women are saying the same uh, and that's what we are also centering we're saying allow us to come into decision making spaces invest in our leadership allow us to be change agents allow us on your committees allow us in decision making spaces and why allow us give us a seat at the table right we're going to allow ourselves to be there so i think that is where we come from uh, in pushing the agenda and we see some of this is actually we submitted the first round of recommendations in february to all member states on behalf of youth across the globe and we've heard back from about 30 member states who've actually picked up some of the language from these recommendations and we encourage you i put them in the chat to look at these recommendations how you can take them back to youth delegates we're also pushing for two youth delegates per state at least for the minimum to be part of official delegations so go find out who's your delegate um, and i think not only for this csw but for cop where young people can engage on the gender agenda on the youth agenda uh, also looking at ecosoc forums where climate has become a big discussion and looking at how we can consolidate all of this in your own you know local spaces because without taking this back it's going to be really difficult to actually create an impact and i think it was really interesting that um the results that you showed just now um you know riya and your colleague other colleague um you said that about most people feel that they're mildly affected by climate change but let us tell you as you um leading these climate change movements and as someone who comes from the women farmers and young farmers movement in india which has been the largest site to talk about the impacts of climate change and you know discussed with the government in the last one year where this is not fringe anymore this is the center youth are facing the biggest brunt um you know we are seeing the historical impact of inequities because of mining because of discriminations um and we're saying decolonize the climate change agenda also look at protecting human rights defenders whether it's in countries where they're speaking up against you know uh, you know against the um unfair impacts of climate change whether they're speaking up on climate whether they're speaking up on human rights and also look at when you know when youth when girls are not able to access resources when they fall into poverty because of climate crisis you know when there's low rain or low water availability or no land or displacement and especially at the time of covid there's an increased vulnerability to gender based violence and to trafficking and we've seen enough reports by young girls themselves documenting what's happening to other young girls uh, pushing this if you could just go to the next slide and this tells us that this is not you know mild impact right this is a core impact which also impacts um how we look at education people slip out of education if you don't have enough food if you don't have enough uh, support systems if you don't have you know if there is a flood in your area as we saw in covid right most impacted were young girls who lost their education and youth who lost um, their opportunities for education because of a digital divide or just no access all of those questions so i think it's similar for climate change um just to say we must center climate change agenda as to what we believe it is right right now climate change is seen as this big words like carbon emission things like that but what do they mean for young girls right that's what it means it means that in your own areas you're not going to be able to access it if you live in urban cities like mine you're going to see pollution levels you can't live with it like in delhi um if you look at other areas you're going to look at oceans taking over in europe you've seen some of the impacts of high levels of sea levels you've seen flooding in germany you know just impacts that have never been seen before and it impacts your houses it impacts that you have to be rescued as we're talking australia has had floods and girls have been at the heart of you know being affected by this so we are pushing for that we are also saying that you have to look at health education in a comprehensive way and not even look at reproductive health rights within this larger discourse and center it because it's core to how um, you know the climate change agenda can go forward we are also saying for all of this have social protections have because if you don't have you know decent work for families girls are going to slip out of education having to bear the brunt of not going to schools of not having enough food in the house of having to do double work in poverty if you're an urban person as well you're not going to have enough protections choices you make get impacted where you can study further where you can grow further you know there's early child marriage which is linked to all of this 
as well. So our demands are to put this on the agenda, right? And I'm just going to run through some of the other ones if you could go to the next slide, because I've already said how disasters impact girls the most. And we know that, you know that better than me, you've lived in disaster areas. Um, so what we're saying is also understand, you know, like that women and girls in are not in land titles. They don't, have, there's not enough data to tell us what we're thinking about, right? Today, it's just perception data of maybe it's mildly affected. But if government started collecting data on young girls, on women, to see how we were impacted, it would actually tell us what's happening in the real world. Now, for all of this, girls need to be part of the process themselves, deciding what's impacting them, having spaces in government to talk about it, being heard in different forums, creating youth forums, having your own organizations you know, which can support a little money for you to come together and have these conversations, resourcing you to be like IBVM is doing, right? Giving you this space, this conversation to be able to actually talk about climate change, right? So may there be many more IBVMs in the world today uh, talking about the same thing. And how do we do that? We must ask for more and more resourcing of young people. You know, young people are the Greta's of the world, the Vanessa's of the world have actually, the Disha Ravi's of the world have actually led it the biggest um, you know, forums like Fridays for Future are youth-led. Um, you can't hear me? Is there a lag? I can just see something in the chat. Um, can you just confirm that you can hear me? Yes. Okay, we can perfect. hear you. Yeah, I just saw something in the chat so I was wondering. And to do all of this, allow, uh, you know, allow spaces for all these opportunities. So just if you could switch off the slide, I'll take another one minute if that's all right. Um, just to say that, you know, how can you join this um, space? And I think girls have led this as Isidora from Chile again and again says, don't think of girls as a monolith as well, right? There are girls from different race, class, abilities. As a disabled girl, she keeps saying it that there is ableism in these spaces. There is, uh, you know, unfair disadvantages to girls where we just think of them as people who are receivers of education, right? Or receivers of certain programs, but you're the one who are actually designing it. You're going to be the ones who actually look at how it gets implemented. And as a co-youth with you, I think it's time that we lead the agenda, right? Like co-lead it. We look at intergenerational dialogues. We look at governments listening to us every time uh, we speak up. So I would really push you to look at these recommendations in that light. And I'm happy to have more conversations with the young girls on what are your recommendations over the next one hour. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jivika, for these inspirational words on how we as young people can engage on, um, to tackle climate change. Okay, so now we'll follow with uh, the two videos we have prepared. One is from Olive Lanyon, as I said before, she's a student from the Loreto School of Ballarat in Australia. And the other one is um, Anitalia's Pijacci's Cuyedo's video, who's um, a Colombian indigenous woman uh, and rights activist. We'll start with Olive's video, if you could please. Okay, let's go. Hello, my name is Olive. I'm from. Could you guys hear that? Yes. All right, perfect. From Ballarat, Victoria, Australia. I have been involved in environmental actions all of my life because that's how I have been brought up, and my whole family really cares about this issue. Today, I'm going to be telling you about my experiences in being a youth activist and what I do within my environmental group and my opinion on women and climate change. My experience in being a youth activist is, I guess, as good as any. I feel there is only a certain amount of change I can make because in the end it is up to the politicians of the world to make a change. Especially as a teenager, I get even more disregarded just because I am young, even though it is my future I am fighting for. I think that this really needs to change as young people often have a lot of logical and good things to put forward, but people just don't listen. My group BICC tries to spread awareness in the Barrett community and we have done things like organising school strikes and collaborating with other environmental groups in our community. For the school strike, one member of BICC from each school would liaise with the school and help students to be able to come. My school, Loreto, was very supportive of the strike, which was fantastic. Loreto also allowed us to wear our uniforms, which some schools in Ballarat didn't allow the students to do. So it was really great to see Loreto being, letting us do that. 
So overall, my experience in my community as a youth activist has been a very good one. When it comes to girls having the ability to be activists and participate in making their future better, I really think that it just comes down to education and opportunities. Often in developing countries, girls don't get a very good education, let alone sometimes any education at all. This is a really big problem because it then means that girls don't get leadership positions in sustainability because they don't have the knowledge and the education to do so. I think we really need to work on getting girls all around the world the education that they need so they can then go on and get leadership positions and be more present in making decisions for our future world. Thank you. Okay, so after having this very interesting video from uh, Olive, Hello, we'll follow with Anitalia's video. Saludo especial a todos los presentes en este espacio de encuentro, de diálogo, de escucha y de corazonar juntos por esta, por esta casa común, por este planeta Tierra. Soy Anitalia Pijachi Cuyuedo, de la Amazonía colombiana, del pueblo indígena Ocaina. Soy madre, hija y esposa. Y desde este espacio quiero compartir con ustedes un poco sobre mi labor como mujer. Habito en el resguardo indígena Ticuna Huitoto. En ella crecí, nací y he conformado mi familia. Y juntos con mujeres, y en especial las mayores, nuestras abuelas, las portadoras del saber, desde el 2005 vengo con ellas trabajando, con las familias en especial, un proceso de sostenimiento, salvaguarda de nuestro territorio. Porque sin la tierra, pues no somos nada. No tenemos dónde forjar, no tenemos dónde construir nuestra casa donde nuestros niños y niñas y jóvenes puedan crecer como seres humanos, cuidadores y salvaguarda de este planeta, del conocimiento, de las semillas, de esto a que nosotros le decimos nuestro gran anánico, nuestra casa colectiva. Quiero comentarles con ustedes que tenemos muchas dificultades para cuidar nuestro gran planeta, porque la amenaza no es desde adentro, la amenaza es desde afuera. Desde afuera hacia adentro y adentro también contamina mucho de nuestros líderes que dañan el pensamiento con eso que nosotros no hemos aprendido a tocar. Que para nosotros decimos que eso está frío y que eso ha traído problemas, que son los recursos, los dineros. Nos han dividido, han creado conflictos en nuestras comunidades. ¿Por qué? Porque desconocemos cómo podemos utilizarlo. Porque desde el mundo afuera... El dinero es sinónimo de, de riqueza, de acumulación y también de vanidades. Entonces no ha traído vanidad y estas vanidades crean conflictos en nosotros. Tenemos necesidades, muchas, en especial en el tema educativo, porque la educación occidental genera muchos gastos. La educación primaria, la educación básica secundaria y aún más la universitaria, donde nuestros jóvenes tienen que salir a trabajar y a estudiar, y a veces no resisten y tienen que regresar al territorio. Las becas son escasas, y si las hay, son contaditas, y para algunos cuantos. Agradezco a todos ustedes por este espacio de compartir y de escucha y de corazonar juntos. Agradecer a ustedes la disponibilidad de sentir desde muy lejos, desde Canadá, a esos territorios amazónicos, y decirle que Estamos juntos, cada vez que nos escuchamos estamos sanando, cada vez que proponemos estamos forzando trabajo en unidad. Muchas gracias, hasta la próxima. Ok, so after this Spanish speaking video, as the majority of you are English speakers, I can try to summarize very briefly what um, Anitalia has just said. The thing is that she emphasized the fact of being a mother, a daughter, and also a spouse. And um, she highlighted the, her, her role as an indigenous woman 
uh, in a community in Colombia, in the Amazon. The thing is that she has been working since 205 uh, to keep uh, their land sustainable. Uh, and she says that we have to take care of our planet, which is our common house. And she has also emphasized several difficulties which um, they are facing in her community, in her indigenous community. For example, the first thing she highlighted was the fact that there is a lack of um, committed politicians and government officials uh, who are mainly driven by money and don't address this effectively, this climate issue. And another uh, point which uh, she highlighted was the fact that there is still room for improvement regarding quality education for all, kind of, uh, all kinds of girls and boys at schools, because um, sometimes the majority of them lack the resources to access to quality education. And that's some kind of a, <laughs> a brief summary of what Anitalia has just been saying. So now we'll follow with the Q&A section. No, sorry. <laughs> we have a video prepared for you regarding the working group on girls' um, uh, work. So let's see if we can have a look at it. The following is the statement from the girls on the Commission of the Status of Women and Girls. We, the girls of the 66th Commission on the Status of Women and Girls, see climate change as a global emergency particularly in the context of girls' rights. Climate change worsens long-standing inequalities for girls, including gender-based violence and jeopardized access to education, economic security, and health resources. We call on the member states of the United Nations to recognize and act on this growing problem. As the severity of natural disasters increases, so does climate migration and displacement, increasing girls' vulnerability to child marriage, pregnancy, and physical dangers, including gender-based violence, lack of food and clean water, and an increase in housing insecurity. These are exacerbated by the absence of gender-conscious legislation, leading to a reliance on charities for disaster relief. To resolve these issues, we urge member states to establish disaster resilience programs and invest in disaster resilient hospitals, homes, schools, and shelters and ensure girls equal access to safe and accessible disaster relief programs, including nutritious food, clean water, menstrual products, and proper sanitation facilities. Climate change related economic insecurity forces girls into unpaid domestic labor, like caregiving and fetching water. Hindering their ability to pursue full education, formal careers, and economic security. Increased financial burdens caused by climate change put girls at a disproportionate economic disadvantage and increases gender-based violence. In order to equip girls with the skills we need to problem solve and lead community-based climate resilience initiatives, we demand that member states ensure girls' educational opportunities are equal with boys and implement programs that focus on STEM subjects, emphasizing green skills and adaptable agriculture practices. We, the girls of the 66th Commission on the Status of Women, call on UN member states to examine climate change's disproportionate effects on girls. Member states must actively recruit girls most impacted by climate change, especially those from rural and indigenous communities, to be at the forefront of policy decision making in order to produce girls specific solutions. This can be achieved by eradicating stereotypes about girls' ability to lead listening to girl activists and encouraging them to take up leadership positions. Member states must also hold entities that emit large amounts of carbon dioxide accountable for causing climate change. By compelling them to reduce emissions and rectify the damage that has been done by climate change. The UN Charter is committed to ensuring the protection of human rights. Mitigating the effects of climate change on girls 
and securing our rights is included in that promise. Member states are responsible for supporting girls and ensuring that girls are equipped with climate adaptation resources and educational opportunities. We expect these responsibilities to be fulfilled without delay. Full protection of human rights will only be achieved once girls, too, have equal rights and freedoms. Okay, so um, with um, these very nice video we, which we have just um, um, seen, uh, the thing is that um, I have to mention that um, Eva, who's uh, helping us from the Mary Ward Centre in Toronto, would like just to say a brief message from both Anitalia and Janet as they had been having, um, they have been having some technical issues in joining today. So Eva, the floor is yours if you would like to add something. Hello, Eva. Um, I request everyone to switch to the Spanish channel, uh, only then. Okay. Okay. Let's see if Eva can have a few words. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you, Eva, for your message from the part of uh, both Genev and Anitalia. And now, as um, previously um, organized, um, uh, following our planning, we'll um, jump into the Q&A section. I believe that my um, colleague um, Elish will be moderating this section. Uh, yes, um, 
So if anyone has any questions related to anything that we've been discussing or hearing about today, please leave them in the Q&A chat box and we will have some um, women and girls responding. Okay, so we have a question about, um, what's not so much a question, but possibly a discussion point about the um, impact that politicians can have and the access of politicians to finance and a greater network and comparing that to a more commun community access and um, the chance for networking of young girls. Um, would anyone like to speak on how young girls can have the opportunity to network um, in comparison to a politician? I could maybe say a word on this. Um, I mean, it, it's it's come up I, again. I'm always speaking from from my view in this as a private sector and, and a company in the energy sector, which is very has a very long term view in the sense that um, the, these investments are, they need to you know taking that decision to invest, you need to have a clear view of policies or targets and so on and i can also looking back and in and, and the recent past in there's been a change also in in the in in let's say in in in, in policies and and what governments are implementing or or targets they're defining uh, i think this is also driven by a huge increase in social demand for more ambitious policies. And I totally agree that governments have a key role to play in here because they need to set the targets, they need to set the policies so that we all, and this is consumers, but it's also the companies, it's all stakeholders can you know, know where, the, where we're heading and, and take decisions no? and, and implement all those things that have come up in the survey. So I think that social demand has increased a lot in, in, in the past years, and I think that the youth movement has had a huge impact, and, and you are all shakers. You're shakers of, of the system as we know it and the status quo, and, and that has really changed. And, um, and, and, and now uh, more than 80% of the world CO2 emissions, um, they're in a country that has defined targets to be net zero, um, net zero emissions, that is, in 2050 or maybe, you know, 2060, 2070, depending on the country, but around the 2050 area. And, and um, I am not saying that this is done. <laughs> There's a lot because those targets need to be implemented, that there's a huge room and a lot of things to do in the, in the policy side. But just, you know, I do wanted to share that we are seeing a change, a very important change in that direction. And this is really driven because there is a social demand that really wants us, our governments to, to take more ambitious action there. I don't know if that answers that question, but at least adds to the, to the discussion. Thank you. Um, I think that does answer the question definitely. And if any of the um, girl speakers would like to share a perspective from a young person on networking. If I may. Um, so speaking from my personal personal experience, and I believe that Olive will agree with me here because she has been a part of the BACC that is a climate action co-op in Australia, and uh, to everyone else, all the girl advocates who are present here, and they would second me, I believe, and I say that um, being a part of the civil society, be it through a larger organization like the IBVM, UN NGO, 
or girl activists who enter these circles individually representing their local very small scale L. Um, student-led organizations. You get to meet a lot more people who were once unsupported by their state or by any larger organization and get to a point where you can actually be a part of processes such as adolescent girls advisory bodies. So uh, for the young people, and I think Jeevika would be a better person to speak about this, but especially when it comes to food security and laws around food security, we have seen that Protests are one of the best forms of communication available to the young people. So it's the first thing that you need to do is to show up. And even though it may feel that your voice is insignificant or it isn't being heard, trust me when I say this, that more so in the modern world with the advent of digital technology, which is allowing us to run online campaigns, every single thing that you say matters and somehow it is amplified when you get more people to think like you and when you get more people to understand the message that you're giving. And the other point is about, you know, especially about networking. It is finding a local group of people who think like you or who believe in the same things that you believe in and to advocate with them. The more people that you have on your side, the bigger your message becomes and eventually to find ways to network with the global body of girls and eventually get involved in bigger processes. And uh, once again, I believe that um, our adult speakers would be better equipped to answer this, especially Jeevika, because she is the national gender youth advocate. So if she has anything to add, sure, she might. Do you want me to jump in or? Okay. Um, I'm just going to say I don't think adults first have better answers than girls. Uh, so I just wanted to clarify on that one. Perhaps what we have is what we've done wrong and perhaps things that you can learn from. And especially as young people, we take the leverage of at least speaking in these forums. Um, so I just wanted to say, yes, raising a voice, whether in your communities, it's called advocacy, it could be called protests, it could be called showing up, it could be called networking, different ways of calling it but I think the larger question is to be able to raise the voice of voice from a lived experience right or from others experiences understanding it and there has been a lot of space uh, for that um, which is opening up I'm not saying we're hurt fully so I think um, just in the context of another question that came in the chat which was around you know what do we do with these 12 points these are just I mean these have just been put together for you to remember that they are 12 they could actually be broken down into 100 as well um, we have tried to focus on what's not in the agreements around climate change, right? What needs to be added and what are the core things that even if they're there need to be reiterated. We've not looked at the whole gamut because there's a lot more around climate change and young people that can be put in. Uh, so, but taking this to your member states, asking them, have, do you have a point in education that you have pushed forward? Have you asked for a youth space? Have you asked for a girl advisory body? Have you even mentioned the word girls in your negotiations even once? You know, it requires a simple mail to your finding out who your representative is in your country who's going to do negotiations. Even today, the negotiations are going on at CSW, right? We feel like this is just too much paper. We literally, as youth, marked up every line to see where our recommendations fit in. So to have access to this, right? Because you're not going to have access to these documents. Breaking it down, this is the first bit. But the other one is nobody's going to listen to you unless you speak up enough, right? And that's where you hear from you know, youth movements across the world, whether you're looking at movements in Latin America, which has spoken about climate change, whether you're looking at Europe, whether you're looking at even India. I mean, I can speak only to my context where, you know, farmers and especially young girls have spoken up and women have spoken up. Fridays for Future Head, Disha Ravi spoke up the loudest with it, you know, on social media about giving those rights to farmers for basic minimum protection so that they don't fall into poverty. And recognizing that she comes from a farming family, we come from families where farming is the norm and we're still looking at about 70% of the world you know, young women and girls and women being farmers being in the informal sector not having enough security so go out there take these recommendations um, we've done a simple summary which is the slides that we shared in the chat but there is a longer version of this which is 70 pages for anyone who wants to engage with the 70 pages literally take it back there are enough youth delegates who are on social media go find them for your country some of the countries who responded to us right now in a positive way have been the UK delegation has sat with us and literally marked up things Austria 
Um, Tajikistan has given us a good response as well. There are some countries in Latin America which have said, "Come talk to us." But we need others to start talking, right? This is where, especially around gender, you don't see so much interest of government. So pushing the gender agenda as girls to say we also believe. I mean, this is where we stand, and also speaking up really loudly to be in these spaces. You know, this assumption that Ria, yeah, you have that adults speak better. I think adults speak differently, right? There's no better or worse, and we must start speaking our own realities, speaking confidently, like all my uh, other co-panelists who are girls. So just go ahead and do that. That's all I'd say. Thank you for that. I think that really outlines the importance of an intergenerational discussion, um, which is why I think everyone is really excited to have these conversations. And I just want to add one thing, if I may, because I think there are some opportunities. Yeah. There's a civil society consultation on the 18th. Um, civil society always means youth and girls, even if they don't state it, take your space. So sign up for it in the CSW system. Sign up and find out where in NGO CSW you can speak up. We're also having a uh, you know, the global youth who was part of UN processes. We are holding a young feminist manifesto around CSW on the 16th at the NGO forum. There are also, there's a girls accountability event, which is there, I think, I mean, I'll give you the dates in the chat right after this. I think it's 15th or 16th, which is being led by Purpose and uh, other organizations. So look at, because unless we start talking the language of accountability, asking, and I'm going to put a document done on how girls are asking for more accountability from, you know, young people, young women and girls. I'm going to put it in the chat. Look at it, use that, understand how you can advocate better. Um, yeah. Um, we have a question about um, the green hydrogen mentioned by Martha. If you could um, speak more on the possible impact on long-term food security. Um, okay, so so basically, what how we're tackling green hydrogen is we're looking at well, first of all, in 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 the in the electricity sector, we're seeing that. Um, First things we need to do is work on energy efficiency. And then also because we've had a photovoltaic and we've had wind, wind power, and there's so there's a, a range of, of renewable energies that can be that, that can be used and, and they're really cost effective now. So we're seeing that number one is try to electrify end uses. So that's and then so one energy vector for decarbonization is electricity, which can do a lot because that's where technologically, that's when renewables are entering easier than, than other sectors. And that's allowing also to, for example, to reach like transport and so on. Hydrogen plays a part because there are some sectors where you electricity cannot make it. And so that's when green hydrogen comes in. Um, so these sectors, they would need, they would need hydrogen in some form, or maybe they're using methane or some gas that contains this hydrogen in it. So the idea is to be able to generate that hydrogen via renewables and then use that to meet the energy need that that sector might have, or the use that they're doing of hydrogen uh, for other products, like for example, fertilizers. So basically hydrogen has that or the way we see it or, or the way we're tackling it is, is it has that role where in specific niche sectors where you cannot do other things. So uh, I'm not an expert on the technology. So, so when it comes to energy, I guess that the question is referring to uh, probably a collateral impact maybe on, on, on food, food security or maybe different applications of green hydrogen when applied to, to, to the to, to the food sector, let's say, or to the agroalimentary sector. Um, so I would have to know a little bit more about the, the, the angle to, to the question, but basically um, th that's how we are approaching. So we're looking into electrification where we can with renewables and then, and then, and, and then green hydrogen. But it's interesting because one thing that's another trend that, that, that we have to take into account is that you, there's, I mean, there's no point in fixing maybe a problem, no, an energy problem, if we're going to cause a problem in, in the food sector. So more and more, uh, we're looking at the problem as a whole. So, so okay, yes, like we, can, we, we need to fix, and there's now lots of discussion also on maybe natural-based solutions and all these things that you can fix one problem, 
but that's not good enough if, if you're generating you know problems in, in other areas so if, if you fix an energy problem and you generate a food security problem or if you are creating uh, uh, you know an economic impact because you're displacing populations and things like that or biodiversity you know when you're looking at uh, you do one thing and then you know that you create a problem on biodiversity it sometimes is unwanted but we need to make sure that what it's done it really does take into account all those angles no? that's 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 an, a difficult task to do but i think it's fundamental if if we want to get it right or if you're taking a decision and, and doing you know doing some right but some wrong and at least that we all are aware of what's happening and, and you can counter up the, the impact thank you marta i think there was a another question um that i think jivaka did you want to answer um regarding uh, girl the, wants to answer that yeah. first actually yeah it basically is about whether girls should be leading this and doing this alone or it's important to be inclusive one of the girls in the panel might want to answer that i put my bit do any of you want to take it so i mean i'm just going to point out some of the challenges in ria perhaps you can come in uh after me is you know while we speak to ourselves as young people someone's got to listen and unfortunately those in power have hierarchy of age at this point of time um so get into politics as young people push push yourselves into decision making spaces and perhaps in a day and age when girls are decision makers in governments that can be a reality because of course younger people uh, come with fresh ideas and perspectives but at this point of time i think both putting your own voice loudly independently as well as negotiating intergenerationally both have their own role to play according to me thank you is there a girl speaker who'd like to add a um impression of this um there, there might be just something that i might might want to add to this and it is that you know just as jivika said that there's a hierarchy of age right now so obviously younger people younger leaders too are overshadowed by older politicians and stakeholders uh, one thing that we can do and make use of the time the time in which we are not there yet or the time during which young people don't have uh, the appropriate amount of space in decision making is that we can eliminate the problems that we see today in these power structures. We see a lot of ableism. We see, especially in South Asia, we see homophobia, we see transphobia. We see structures which we as the coming generation can with, you know, when we are in a position of power or in a position where we get to have a say in the way in which decisions are made and who has access to these decision making places, we can build ourselves to be resilient to these problems. We can transform the structures in our own organizations. Like um, the, this group of interns is a very small example, but other spaces where young girls are being organized, young girls organize themselves and mobilize themselves, they can make sure that while they are wherever they are, they can combat these, these particular issues like ableism, transphobia, homophobia, so that when we finally get to where we want to be or where we, when we finally get the space, these are the problems that our group wouldn't have to face. I think that's it. Thank you. Um, I think we have one question about um, the reversal of environmental damage that lingers due to colonization. Um, although I'm not sure um, if this is, well, if anyone would like to take this question, um, then do feel free. Um, Yeah, I think it's some, one of the things written in our recommendations as well yeah. to say, and I think it's clearly said by young people, especially in the global south, that it's not only about just damage or adaptation or mitigation. Adaptation means adapting to what the current situation is or trying to avoid a future situation. We're also in a situation that there's been such a legacy of loss of you know degradation of impacts because and that's why we're saying use the decolonial language 
also understand this whole loss and damage, which is such a big part of the climate change negotiations happening both at COP, you know, the climate change negotiations of the UN, as well as CSW, to say that actually talk about reparation, which means, you know, actually giving it back in the ways communities want who have been deprived for so many years. And within that, what young women, girls, um, you know, youth and all that diversity want, because that is the next, the current and the next generation, you know. So I think it's been a huge demand. There's been some language in the agreed conclusions, but on loss and damage, it's only about adaptation right now, which means adapting to all the problems of climate change. We're saying that needs to be moving. And I think, you know, especially those in the Pacific Islands have been leading this because they're the worst affected by this. They could actually, island nations could actually get wiped out, right? So you're looking at people's existence going away and there must be some reparation for it. So it's a very, very crucial demand even for youth um, going ahead. Is there a youth speaker who'd like to make an addition? Um, I see we've had a hand raised, although um, if you are a participant, could you mention any questions in the Q&A box, please? I would also like to make a contribution, a brief contribution to this question. And the thing is that um, Jevika has um, also mentioned this uh, kind of loss and damage topic, which is in fact, was in fact also a, a topic which was covered in the um, uh, COP26 uh, um, event taking place last year in 2021. And the thing is that I, I believe that there is still um, some kind of room for improvements from the governments from the uh, global north towards the global south countries and uh, especially those countries which were previously uh, colonized and uh, afterwards they've experienced this kind of decolonization uh, process and the thing is that they are the some of these countries are the most affected by climate conditions and uh, this uh, extreme weather events are being experienced there by their populations. So, so for sure, there's still some kind of um, joint, um, a need of joint collaboration from the governments, from the countries in the North to help those in the South and most especially um, the, their respective populations. Hmm. Thank you, Carlotta. Um, is anyone else got a question? Has anyone else got a question? Um, or would anyone else like to add to our discussion? Um, saying that there are no questions, I might want to add something to the previous um, question about decolonization. And yeah, as Jivika and Carlota said that there is obviously this difference between the way the world perceives the global north, uh, the way the, the global north works and the global south works. And um, coming from my perspective, that is someone who um, is a student of engineering, I would say that we need to look at the way innovation functions a little differently, even when we look at the action coalitions. Right. We have an entire action coalition that's dedicated to technology and, and innovation in these places around the world so that technology and innovation is equally accessible to everyone around the world, especially because it's an action coalition to young girls and to women. So when we look at places and let's say just a very common example, we look at the delivery of medicine and we think that if we need to get an organ transported from location A to location B, we need roads, we need this and we need that. But in absence of these very basic technological advances, you may say, roads are one of the most basic technological advances. There are ways to come up and, you know, to mitigate the need of having this one very basic let's say just the way i said roads right so to mitigate the need of roads and to use let's say drones to transport these things and while this may seem very utopian there, there are actually countries in the african continent who have used this form of innovation using drones to transport emergency medicines from point a to point b and this is especially crucial when we talk about um 
uh, women's health and uh, the products that they need to support them through um, pregnancies and emergency situations. So when we talk about these things, it's important to recognize the role of innovation in countries that have traditionally been, been, been left behind. And uh, this is why when we talk about uh, digital spaces, now internet is something that is being increasingly recognized as a human right. This is why it's important because countries that have already been left behind, if they are left further behind, when as the world, you know, we go from the real, landscape to the virtual landscape, just the way we saw during the COVID pandemic. This is just going to worsen things if these countries, even though they have been left behind, don't keep pace with the technological advances around the world. So that's just my bit. Um, I don't know if there are any other questions in the chat, but please go ahead. Um, if we don't have any more collect collections, um, questions um would we move on to concluding remarks um unless anyone likes would like to add anything all right well we can move on to concluding remarks um First of all, uh, once again, I'd like to thank everybody for um, coming out. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, I know on behalf of myself and all of the interns that have got together to um, uh, set up this webinar that this is a subject that means um, a lot in terms of global significance, but it also means a lot to us personally. Um, so we really like to thank you all for um, being here and participating um, alongside us. Um, I'd like to um, first thank um, my fellow interns um, for all of the hard work that you've all put into this. Um, uh, th this has been um, a labor of love and we've really had a great time putting this on. Um, I'd like to thank all of our speakers. Um, Thank you so much for coming out and sharing your wisdom with us um, and uh, engaging in this conversation. Um, I'd like to give special thank yous to um, Sister Janet, Sister Sarah, um, Catherine, and Ava for all of your help in setting up the webinar, in um, also giving us guidance uh, in terms of uh, organization and um, just for all of your help and support. Thank you, you've been amazing ever for translating. Um, I'd like to thank Sister Isabel for translation as well. Um, thank you so much for all of the hard work um, and Sister Natalie as well, um, all of the hard work that you have put into this. Um, and once more, just a thank you to our speakers and to you all for um, coming out today. Uh, have a great day, everyone. And uh, thank you. Thanks, Via, and thanks, everyone, for hosting this. Bye. Thank you so much for coming, Jivika.
Uh, not at all. I'm so glad. I, it was really, and if you could share the survey with us, we'll also put it into the larger youth um, work that's been happening and also recognize you in the next round of the contributions. And if you have any contributions to make um, to the recommendations as well, or send in your recommendations from the girl side, just email it to one of us and we'll just look at it. Okay. Well, thank you so and much. Make sure that it's added to the next version, right? We've been updating okay. versions and sending member states. So in the next one, we'll definitely acknowledge it. Okay. Thank you very much to all of you. It was really, really very inspiring and very interesting. And I feel very excited and very hopeful for our young people. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.